Hi friends, this is Joe, and this is episode number 151 of the Decahedron RPG podcast, and this is officially the start of the holiday season for 2024, because when this episode drops, it will be a day or two before Thanksgiving, when a lot of people are starting their travels for the holiday season, so happy holidays for this year. So that's the happy part. I think that this episode, the topic for this episode, is a little on the unhappy side. So when I was doing OSR October, and I was doing my shallow dive into Dave Arneson's first fantasy campaign, it struck me how often slavery popped up in there. And I was like, wow, that's, that's something I want to look at later. You know, in the early RPGs, what was the role of slavery? And just to say it up front, just to avoid any confusion, <laughs> I think that slavery is an abhorrent evil <laughs> that stains the history of humankind. Period. I, I don't think this is an opinion thing. <laughs> I suppose if you feel differently, you know, I guess that's your right, but I disagree completely. Absolutely. <sighs> so... I looked at the early RPGs, and this is what I found. So first of all, just like I, I said, uh, Dave Arneson's first fantasy campaign. Dave Arneson lists there the prices for slaves, and he says that a male slave will cost you about 75 gold pieces, depending on the strength, and a female slave will cost you about 750, depending on the charisma. And then later in the book, he says that you can hire a slave trainer, you know, when you have your own keep and everything, and you're hiring like your engineers and your alchemists and all that for your keep. You can hire a slave trainer for 350 to 3,500 gold pieces a year to train all your slaves. So I looked at Tunnels and Trolls and... This is what Tunnels and Trolls said. For those with money to burn, there are two kinds of humor auxiliary characters, slaves and hired henchmen. Slaves have no luck and no charisma ratings, and are usually of low IQ. You may select whatever ratings you wish for the other four attributes between 3 and 18. The slave will cost you one gold piece for each factor in its total rating. Thus, a slave with a strength of 10, an IQ of 3, a constitution of 10, and a dex of 7 would cost you 30 gold pieces. Your slaves may be female if you so desire, but they will cost you an extra 10 gold piece for their beauty. So that was from the first edition, but that rule, that text there, persisted all the way up to the fifth edition, which was published in 1979. And the only real difference is they increased the price like tenfold, and uh, instead of being female characters, uh, they change it to you can select characters for uh, slaves for their beauty uh, and you get to pay an extra 10 gold pieces per charisma rating. The next thing I looked at was Empire of the Petal Throne. Um, it's just sort of everywhere in there. I'm not going to pull out anything. It's just part of the culture of that game world. Um, it, it just seeps in it. Uh, and then, of course, I looked at original D&D. And I'm quite pleased to <laughs> report that slaves don't show up in original D&D. They're not in the first three books. They're not in Greyhawk. They do show up in Blackmore. But they're only used as evidence of the bad guy's badness, if you will. Um... Uh, Let's show you that they are evil because they have slaves, that type of thing. And I guess you could say the same for AD&D. By the time we get into, it's not in the rules itself, but by the time we get into the adventure modules, we have against the slavers, which again is showing you these are bad guys. And this is how we know they are bad guys. They are doing this evil thing. So those examples I'm okay with. <laughs> The other thing I saw was in Judge's Guild, where it has this little chart about uh, manumission and uh, talks about the prices and then, uh, you know, 
based on the owner's attitude, how much more you would have to pay. And when I first saw this, because I was glancing, and this was like in my memory years ago, I was like, another example of setting prices for slaves. But I had missed the title uh, manumission on there. <laughs> and that makes me feel a little better about it because manumission is the freedom of slaves. And so I got the impression that this rule was in there. So if your characters uh, came across a slave that maybe did them a good or whatever, they just wanted to free some slaves, this is how much they would have to pay to do so. So those are the examples of slavery in the early RPGs. My take on it. So I've already hinted at it, right? So the Judges Guild example about giving them a price just to free them, I'm okay with that. The AD&D &D example of using them as bad guys, slavers, as bad guys, not slaves. <laughs> uh, I'm okay with that. Um, the tunnels and trolls thing where, hey, you can just buy them instead of hiring a henchman. I, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> and the um, Dave Arneson's thing where they're just another commodity to, you know, buy and sell and trade in. I, I'm not okay in that. In essence, that's making the, the players slavers, right? It's, I, uh, and I guess this is down to the whole thing. Should players be allowed to play evil characters? <laughs> and I guess my answer is no. I mean, you can play whatever you want, right? If you want to play an evil character, if you want to make an evil character, feel free to make an evil character. But at my table, when I'm running it, I, I have no interest in... GMing for evil characters. I, I'm just not going to do it. And so, in that essence, you could say they are forbidding at my table. And I guess this is a thing for me because I want heroes of the story, even though it's an emerging story, not a planned story, to be heroic. And I don't consider slave owning to be a heroic thing at all. I consider it quite the opposite. Now, to give these games a break, I guess, I would say that, you know, the early games are trying to emulate swords and sorcery, not high fantasy. And slavery is a thing that exists in, sli in high uh, swords and sorcery. But again, Conan isn't a slave owner, is he? <laughs> he frees some slaves. He encounters slaves. He's not himself a slave owner, right? Am I right? I don't think I'm wrong on that. If you know differently, leave me a comment. Send me feedback. I mean, this this is definitely a me thing. Back, way back when, what, 20 years ago, there used to be a game called City of Heroes and there was another one called City of Villains, uh, computer games. Uh, multi, massive multiplayer online RPG. City of Heroes, City of Villains. And I played with a guy from work. His name was Tony. Uh, taught me how to play City of Heroes. And then he was like, hey, you want to play City of Villains? I'm like, no, nah, not even a little interested. Never bought it, never downloaded it, never whatever. I, I will not play a, a villainous character unless I'm GMing. I'm setting the villain up as something that needs to be overcome and defeated by my heroic players. That's all I have to say. What do you think? Do you allow your players, if you are a GM or if you are a player, <laughs> would you be a slave owner? Would you want to be a slave owner? I, I, mm, no, I, it rubs me the wrong way big time. Um, I do not support it. Um, like I said, other than uh, for NPC villains, just to show how evil they are. In fact, I think, <laughs> I think the one good thing I would take from the charts about how much they cost, uh, the Judges Guild was the best one, by the way. Wow, that's weird to say. But um, if during adventure, a PC free some slaves, I think I would give them XP value for treasure for that. I think I would, especially if you consider the logic that um, in some games, some tables, you might not give treasure, uh, give XP for treasure until that treasure is spent. I think freeing the slave is spending, it's an opportunity cost is what it is, right? You could have sold it for the gold, but you chose to, um, Spend it on doing good instead. So I, I would count that. I would give them XP for that. 
Yeah, that's me. Let me know what you think. Comments uh, below on YouTube. Feedback at decahedron.com if you're just that kind of person uh, that would rather send email or you want to record a voice feedback and leave it that way. Voice feedback can also be at sayhi.chat slash decahedron. You can call the feedback line. The number is on the screen or it's in the show notes. Have a happy holiday season. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye.